we will go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, as Ashley said, for as you come in, just adding your name, school, or district and role. It's always good to see who has joined us. We see a lot of familiar names and faces. So that's great. Um, let's see. All right. So yeah, so it looks like we're a pretty big group today for the full IEP training. So feel free to drop questions in the chat box and we'll answer them as we go. We'll keep an eye on the chat box. Um, also, I mean, feel free to come off of mute and ask questions. It really is important. Like we are always happy to answer questions as they come up. So if you're comfortable doing that, feel free to do that as well. We will have a stretch break built into the presentation because this is a longer, goes two to two and a half hours for the training. So we'll have a little halfway five minute break. Okay, so today's training is around the full IEP and this is Andrew F and its impact on IEP development and fate. And here is our team. My name is Carly Thibodeau. I joined the team just over a year ago, and before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. And with me today is Ashley. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Satry. I joined the main DOE in July, so it's been about three months now, so I'm fairly new. But I am here with Carly, who will lead us all into this training and before joining the DOE, I was a special ed teacher and case manager in Maine and Virginia for a total of 14 years. Awesome. And Julie is here with us today. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I'm the admin support for the monitoring team. Um, been at DOE for about six and a half years now. And before that, I was admin support at an elementary school for 16 years. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Colette Sullivan is our federal programs coordinator, um, and Jennifer Gleason is another special ed consultant on the team. Um, they are just busy doing other things, so they are not here right now. Um, this is our contact information. If you ever want to get in touch with us, ask us questions, um, just reach out for any kind of support, we are here to support you. So please reach out at any time. We do our best to get back to you within a day or two. All right, our agenda for today, we just did the quick introductions. We're going to go through Andrew F as it applies to the IEP um, and go over other considerations and frequently asked questions. So here is a link to the procedural manual. It's a great resource. Um, if you don't use it, I highly recommend um, getting a copy, keeping it on your desktop or having a printed copy, whatever you like to do. Uh, goes over all those special education forms, has instructions, directions, examples within for each of those. Um, here is a link to MUSER, the Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations. Uh, and this is going to be updated. I think it goes into effect tomorrow. Um, so we will have that link available as soon as that is out and to the public. Um, what is the purpose of an IEP? The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, says that an IEP is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a free, appropriate public education, um, and that they have services designed to meet their unique needs. And it's really about moving them back to general education, because all students are general education students first. And then just a little information as we head into all of this IEP um, training. When we've been to on-site visits in the past, we have noted these things on more than 50% of IEPs um, regarding compliance. And so we had noted that there were gaps identified, but there were no corresponding goals. So that's an alignment piece that we look at. Um, there were how statements missing for both academic and functional in that section four C and D. Um, there were goals that were not measurable because they included references to specific curriculums or standards. And so we're going to go over some of those examples as within our training. Um, but you can't reference those specific curriculums. Um, goals weren't measurable because they included multiple skills and couldn't be clearly reported on during progress monitoring. So remembering that 
one goal is around one skill. Um, present levels included statements like the child struggles with, or they sometimes do this, and there was no baseline data. It's really important in your present level. It must include baseline data. Um, goals did not align with a service. Another alignment piece, uh, the services did not align back to a goal. And then if you write transition plans, that section 9F on the transition plan had child will statements. And we will talk about those a little bit. And then this is a great resource. I know Ashley likes to put a plug in for this. And as a new member of the team, we use this all the time because this is how we get to learn all of the pieces of the IEP that we look at. And so um, if you want to know what we look at for monitoring purposes and compliance purposes, this is a great tool. It goes through each section of the IEP, outlines where the location is, where it is found for user, um, and the criteria to make it compliant. And it is available on our website, the most updated one for the 23-24 cohort. All right. Is the I don't know the number slides actually, so you tell me when it's your turn to take over. I will. Because, I'll just okay. jump over. Yep. It's, All right. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. We're tag teaming a little bit, so I can't remember the numbers. So she's gonna let me know when it, it's my turn to be quiet. <laughs> okay. So we're starting off with section one of the IEP where you put in all of that child information um, right at the top. And so the important thing from this section one, well, it's all important, but the one piece that we look at is that date IEP sent to parent. Okay, so when you're sending out that IEP, once it's been written and you're sending it home to the parent, make sure you put that date that you've sent it to the parent because um, we look for that timeline because Muser does say that a copy of the IEP needs to get to the parent within 21 school days of that IEP meeting at which it was developed. Um, and then also the date of the annual review cannot be greater than the 364 days from the last annual meeting. Um, and the duration cannot be more than 364 days. So we're going to look at this because there are really two timelines going on here. So it gets a little confusing. Um, so you have that annual date of the meeting and then the annual date to the date of the next annual IEP meeting needs to be within that 364 days. Then you have that duration of the IEP, which could be different than your annual date. And so that also, the beginning and end, has to be within that 364 days. They cannot go over that. So we're gonna just kind of show a little visual of how that works. So if we say that we had the annual meeting on 1-6-22, that we have to hold the next annual on or before 1-5 of 23. So that means we give three-ish days for the mail. And so that means that the parents have the written notice by 1-9, let's say. And then it gives them that seven days before the IEP goes into effect, before that IEP begins. And so that's 1-16-22 is when the duration would start. And then the duration would end at least by 1-15-23. It cannot go over the 364 days. So that's where we get those annual dates and then the duration of the IEP dates. Now, the parents can waive that right to that seven-day notice and the IEP can start sooner. So that duration date could be sooner. However, it must be documented in the written notice that the parents waived their seven-day notice. So make sure that if you are starting that duration of the IEP sooner than the seven days or 10 days with the mail and all that, um, that you make sure to document in the written notice that they have waived, that the parents have waived their right to that seven-day notice. Now we just, so what if you hold the meeting but the parent isn't there? Can you call them later and talk about the details of the meeting? And so we just say, we just think or ask you to consider if you talk to them after the meeting, you're getting input from them after the fact. And so this would most likely change the outcome because they would probably have some input or have some ideas about what should be an IEP or things around their student's progress. 
So you would need to write an amendment to the IEP to complete a new written notice um, to capture that conversation. So it's really best if you're going to reach out, if you know that the parent can't attend, really do it before the meeting so you can capture that conversation within the original written notice. Carly, there's a question um, in the chat. Yep. Okay. So can it stay effective immediately with parent agreement or do you need the waived language? I think whatever language you choose to use, uh, whether it's effective immediately or waived, their seven day notice is appropriate as long as you're noting it somewhere in the written notice. Um, so when can a parent guardian not waive their seven day notice? So this is a little quiz and don't feel bad if you get it incorrect because we actually have changed our guidance around this. So if you're going off of what we've told you before, then you're going to be like, oh, no wonder. But if you have an idea of when they cannot waive their seven day notice, drop it in chat. Right. So that is, I see a lot with the initial and that's our guidance change. So it's actually parents cannot waive their seven day notice if they did not attend the meeting. Um, so the initial eligibility or the initial IEP, actually they can waive their seven day notice um, because it was brought to our attention that informed consent doesn't mean that they have to wait those seven days notice as long as they are informed and if they're at the meeting, they they have informed consent so they can waive their seven day notice for that initial. So as long as you note that in the written notice that they have waived their seven day notice, even for an initial IEP, um, and you get that signature for uh, IEP services to begin on that written notice, then you can start within those before that seven day notice. So that is a change in our guidance, yes. This is the first time we've been able to kind of get it out to the field. So this is good. All right. So section two, moving into section two of the IEP, this is uh, where you check off the disability category for the student. And just the definition of a child with a disability is someone that's reached the age of three years, has neither graduated from a secondary school program with a diploma or reached the age of 22. They've been observed in the learning environment. They've been evaluated according to the rules in MUSER and been determined to have one or more of the disabilities listed in MUSER. And so the um, you can see there are a couple of links at the bottom of this slide. The first one is to that administrative letter that was put out in 2021 around that ending age for special ed eligibility changing to 22. And that now has become law. And so um, it is it is in MUSER effective October 25th, 2023, that it has gone from age 20 to age 22 for ending age for special ed eligibility. All right, section two, again, this is just where you check off that disability um, of the student on the IEP. And this is where you can find in MUSER each of those definitions of those disability categories and the procedure for determination. And if you want more information about um, the elig eligibility process and the related forms for that, we do have a uh, recording on our website and this is the link that will take you to that. Excuse me. And then this is our IEP alignment visual. So you can see, excuse me, that um, it really starts off with those evaluations um, where it used to identify that disability category for the student. And then those give you insight to their strengths based on those evaluations and observations, along with um, gives you information about those skill gaps, academic and functional skill gaps of the child. And then those go into your present level, your goals and your services. And then you have those accommodations and modifications that are necessary. And that all is around that least restrictive environment. Talking about all of those pieces of the IEP would lead you to that least restrictive environment for the student. 
All right. So section three. Right, Carly, already, yes. I, I'll tag in. I won't, uh, I won't make you keep going at least for a couple slides here. <laughs> okay. I get to be quiet. All right. You do. Don't worry. It won't last long because I'll tag you right back in. But um, Okay, everybody. <clears throat> I'm going to jump in here on section three, which is the considerations. And this is what we like to think of as the table of contents for the IEP. So just thinking about anything that's documented as a yes in this um, box is going, there's going to be an expectation that there's corresponding information in the IEP itself. So for example, if the child in uh, section H, <clears throat> excuse me, is checked off as yes, having academic needs, we're just going to look down and just expect to see academic programming, functional programming, et cetera. You guys know how that goes. Um, and then that those are sort of the building blocks of that alignment piece, which is what we look at here. So section four is the um, academic, functional, developmental uh, strengths and needs and evaluations of the student. So we'll look at those a little bit more closely. Section 4A is the results of all the evaluations. So you're going to have your academic evaluations that are used for eligibility or continuing eligibility. The same for your functional evaluations any relevant state or district assessments that your student's taking, um, transition assessments, and any other relevant assessments for FBAs or anything like that related to service evaluation. Um, so when you're filling in box 4A with that evaluation information, just make sure you're putting the evaluation name itself. Um, we try to um, give guidance not to do the acronyms for the whole thing, just to make sure that that's parent friendly language. Um, you know, if you reference it more than once, that's fine, but try to put that name in there first. Um, and then the date that the evaluation was given and then keep any scores that highlight strengths or needs of the student profile. And then maintaining any scores that support the eligibility in between those evaluation years. Um, so just make sure if it, it's not a triennial that you're keeping that info in there that supports the disability category. Um, section 4B, that's your academic, functional, and developmental strengths of the student. So this is going to be those observable strengths that your student has. And this is kind of the part of the IEP where you can get a little bit fluffy, as Jennifer likes to say, where you can put a little bit of um, if your student is friendly or if they are a good communicator or something like that um, that's observable in the classroom. Um, make sure that this is not left blank and it's not an A. Um, there needs to be some strengths in there. Um, hang on just one second. Look at this question. Um, talking about the NLL, ELL services. Um, Carly, do you want to answer that real quick? The chat question? Uh, yes. So I'm not a great expert on this and I can bring this back to the team but what I do know is about section three if you check off that you have the multilingual learner uh, you should have an ILAP an individual language acquisition plan um, with your ELL person um, and so that would be documented in section six uh, under the accommodations you would want to reference that. And I'm pretty sure when we get to section six, there's a an example and there's an ILAP on the accommodations page. So we can talk a little bit more about that when we get to section six, if that's okay. Um, okay, so then for section three, just one other thing is just making sure you're not restating those standard scores or evaluation scores that are in section 4A. Um, there's a rule of, I think it's called the rule of construction in the IEP that um, when it's in one section of the IEP, it does not need to go in another section. So just use this 4B as a time to share those um, observations and evaluative strengths or relative strengths of your student. So um, then we're going to start looking at the academic section of the IEP. So when we're talking about academics, we're talking about those broad areas of reading writing, listening and speaking, um, and mathematical problem solving. And so here's section 4C of the IEP where you're going to be putting those academic uh, distinctly measurable and persistent gaps. Um, but this is a 
two-part box. So when you're looking at this section 4C, make sure you're putting those distinctly measurable skill gaps in there, as well as the how statement, which is how those distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps affect the child's involvement in the gen ed curriculum. So it's a two-part section, and we'll look at this a little bit closer. Um, when you are looking at those academic broad areas on the left side, um, what we really want you to do as your IEP team, look at your student and see what specific areas they're struggling in, what you're specifically going to be targeting with those goals. So uh, for reading, instead of saying that the student has a gap in reading, what you're going to want to do is really look and see what that skill gap is. Are they struggling with fluency? Are they struggling with comprehension? Is it phonemic awareness? Um, and the same in math, instead of saying that they're, the student struggles in math, you're going to tell us whether it's addition and subtraction, is it word problems, measurement, um, just give us those very specific skill areas that, um, again, is going to align to the gaps or the goals that you're going to be writing for your student. Um, and here are some examples of what those gaps look like and how that how statement could look. So with the reading example. So Jimmy's been identified as having a fluency gap. He's got an issue with fluency and this impacts his ability to access the grade level reading material. So that statement doesn't need to be um, super specific, but it does need to reference what how it's impacting their progress or their um, participation in the gen ed curriculum. So um, grade level material or appropriate grade appropriate math activities. Um, what is it that they can't do in the classroom without that specific support? Um, and then in the procedural manual, it goes into it a little bit further on page 22. I know as a teacher, I was not very familiar with the procedural manual and there's a, a lot of great information in there. So this goes into detail about section 4C and how to list those needs and the how statement. Um, and again, one thing I forgot to mention is with those um, needs, we recommend listing those in a bulleted list because then we're going to look for alignment with your goals. Um, and it just makes it easier if you know that your student has two skill gaps that you're working on and you put them in a bulleted list, then you'll know to be writing two goals to address each of those skill gaps. Um, let's see, wondering how to write this on 4C if the student has an IEP, but it's is all in general ed classes. Um, Carly? So if you, okay, so are they, just have some follow-up, are they receiving specially designed instruction in the general ed class or they do not have specially designed instruction? I asked two questions, so I'm not sure what the no is. Okay, so no, they do not have specially designed instruction. If they do not have specially designed instruction, then you would not list it as a skill gap. Because if you list something in section 4C as a skill gap that they need um, a special ed service to address this gap, then there has to be a goal and there has to be a service. So if they have no specially designed instruction, then they would, you would not list this in section 4C. You're welcome. You guys be, we'll all be grateful that Carly is here to answer our specific questions. <laughs> Um, all right, Carly. So uh, moving on to that functional section. So again, when you're looking at the functional, these are those broad areas that we would target with functional goals, but um, the, the broad areas are that cognitive, the communicative, motor, adaptive, social, uh, emo social, emotional, and sensory areas. Um, but this is the same setup as the academics. So in 4D, you're gonna have those specific skill gaps listed, those distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps in the functional performance, as well as your how statement. So the same thing with the how statement, um, being about how it affects their progress in the gen ed, and you'll want both parts. Um, and so the, there we go. 
those there are those broad areas on the left side. And again, you can work with your teams and your service providers, et cetera, to find out what area is that you're going to be targeting for them. Um, so this is the specific areas for a student who might have a, we'll go with a sensory um, deficit. So if they if they're struggling with um, self-regulation, for example, that would be your skill gap that you're going to list in 4D. And then you're going to combine it with your how statement, which could be something like um, that. Well, what did I say? Um, sensory, so tactile defensiveness for Barb. Um, her how statement would be that that would impact her ability to stay on task in all grade level activities. So you can combine those. If the student has multiple skill gaps, you can combine them into one all encompassing how statement if that works or you can do individual house statements just as long as you have that house statement there. Um, and the procedural manual references this 4D on pages 22 and 23. Um, and looks like 4C would be blank if the student is academically. Um, so if the student is not receiving academic services, you would will get into this a little bit further uh, into the presentation, but that present uh, 4C would not be blank, Carly. It would be... Technically, it can be blank, but it always makes me really nervous to leave pieces blank on the IEP because, you know, we say all the time, don't leave any blank boxes. So you can just put NA kind of like you do with developmental if the kiddo doesn't have any developmental stuff, um, or you can do the same statement that we're going to talk about in the present level, which is that they have no academic needs or that they're commensurate with peers or something like that. You're welcome. All right. So, yep, again, there's the procedural manual, so you can reference those that section 4D. It's really um, helpful. It tells you um, how to fill that out and what is expected to be there. And Section 4E, it'll start, I'll start to sound a little bit like a broken record, but it's the same thing. This is around those developmental needs. So again, you're going to want to have, if you have a student with developmental needs, you're going to want to have the distinctly measurable persistent gaps for developmental performance and the how statement for how that uh, affects the child's involvement in the gen ed curriculum. And the question always comes up, of course, if it's is the skill deficit a functional issue or a developmental issue? Um, this is an IEP team decision, but our guidance is kind of uh, that if it's a lifelong skill deficit that the IEP team feels that the child will not outgrow, then you're probably looking at a functional deficit. And if it's a lagging skill deficit that the IEP team feels the child may outgrow in some of those younger children, then you're generally looking at a developmental goal. Um, and just remembering in those skill, specific, skill deficits and gaps, what are those specific areas that the student is struggling in? Be very specific. Um, don't give us the math, reading, writing, um, executive functioning. Give us the very specific skill gap that, the, that you're going to find goal. Um, do not include or reference those broad areas, any evaluation results or any standard scores. Um, and here's what that will look like on the IEP. Here's an example for 4C. We have a student who's been identified with that distinctly measurable and persistent gap in fluent letter identification. It's bulleted. You have his how statement, which is that skill gaps in this area impact Eli's ability to participate in literacy activities of same age peers. And then you have your functional performance in 4D, which is Lewis, who has a skill deficit in his ability to read and follow a schedule. There's that distinctly measurable and persistent gap. And then your how statement for Lewis being that this impacts his ability to attend school and participate in all daily activities across his day. Uh, and make sure that you have both components, just star those. Those are the two part sections where you need the bulleted gap and your how statement. All right, we're going to do a couple of little quizzes on that information. Um, we're going to look at section 4A first. Here's a section 4A. Um, you can put in the chat box why this results uh, and initial evaluations would be non-compliant. 
Yes, that's right. We need the date of testing there. And the name is not there. You're right. Using the acronym. Awesome. You guys got it. Um, and let's see. Full name of assessment, date, name. Got it all. Yep. Um, so I think somebody saw it. I think I it jumped past me in the uh, chat box. But yes, we need those strengths too from the uh, Woodcock Johnson. Just make sure that they're if that you're putting all that evaluative information in there. So here it is with the name, the dates, and you've got some strengths and gaps. To include specific scores as in the example. So I think, yes, Carly. Um, I've seen, as long as there's data in there, um, I know that I've seen some where they put like average or below average, they use those or they use their percentiles. Um, whatever it is, however it is that you're communicating um, the level of the student, you know, showing their strengths and their needs. So um, there should be some data in there. The name of the evaluator is up to your director. So it is not a, it's not something that we look for in the monitoring process. So having the evaluator's name there or not there would not make a difference to us as far as compliance, um, but you can use it. You can put it if your director is like, no, I want you to put the evaluator name. Right, I mean, best practice, yes, would be to label it as this is a standard score or a scaled score or the our our ex our examples aren't always <laughs> like <laughs> spot on. We're we're doing it in the moment kind of thing. So these are all made up. <laughs> so we just kind of pull them. Sometimes it helps our next training though when we're like, oh, let's yes. change that. <laughs> yes, it does help us to improve for sure. We'll look at another section here. Um... Oh, there. Sorry, there is one more about putting the observation intro oh, okay. into the section. Um, I don't think that's a bad, I wouldn't put the whole observation just because that's a lot of information, but if you wanted to put key pieces that relate to those strengths and needs of the student, absolutely. Oh, really? Sync has limited characters in that box. Maybe if you have to put the acronym, you spell it out in the written notice. Right. I mean, the acronym is okay, like Ashley said, just making sure that you have talked to the parent and kind of explain what that acronym stands for so that it's clear to all of the IEP team members. Yes, especially if you have a student, so the BASC or other parent teacher, like I said, anything in that eval section that really speaks to those strengths or needs of the student are definitely important to have in that section due to that alignment piece, because really anything in that evaluation section um, aligns to other pieces of the IEP, then it definitely should be in that eval section. A BASC, definitely, especially if the student is identified as OHI due to ADHD, that is necessary to have in that section. All right, let's see what our next example is gonna be. There you go. I was like, oh no, Carly, don't be frozen. We'll all be in trouble. Um, Not frozen. <laughs> um, okay, so so any eval that supports the classification should be in 4A. Yes, that is correct. Um, and looking at section 4B, um, so what is non-compliant about this section 4B, which is the strengths, uh, academic functional development, str developmental strength of the child? I have to keep closing the chat box, so you'll excuse me if I miss out any, but I can't look at the PowerPoint and the chat box at the same time. Uh, no strengths listed, can't be NA, very good, that's right. Yes, every student has a strength, so exactly right. Um, and then we are looking at section four, 
uh, B. And these are, this is, oh, this is the example, sorry. Um, so again, just that example. I didn't read it to you last time, so I will this time, just in case you can't see that because it's kind of small text. But so the strengths here for Leora are that she loves to read and has strong decoding and comprehension skills. She has strong writing skills and enjoys sharing her stories with her peers. That's one of those fluffy kind of things you can put in there that's not really um, backed by data so much, but as by observation. And then Leora works hard and is very focused on all tasks presented to her. So we will try another one. Um, looking at this section 4C, this is that um, the academic gaps, skill gaps, skill deficits, and how they affect the child's progress. Is that non-compliant? That's broad, not specific enough. We need that specific skill. And yes, there it is. Somebody caught the how statement. Very nice. Good job, you guys. So. Yep, just again, those are those two broad areas. So you're going to give those specific skill deficits and keep that how statement in there. So instead, there's your bulleted list with your skill gaps and your how statement. Nice job. You guys are all pros. Um, and then one more. Section 4D. So it says Julia has executive functioning deficits and cannot maintain attention to task. Why would this be non compliant? And you're right, it's not specific enough. And the house statement is too broad. You guys are great. Very nice. Good job. Um, okay. We do not need to hammer on that anymore. It seems like you guys are all pros. Okay. There's another example of what it could look like. She has deficits in her ability to self-initiate. That's that specific skill gap. And then the how statement, this impacts her ability to maintain attention and complete assigned tasks. All right, so we're going to just look at the chat box real quick. Do you guys have any questions about those sections before we move on? You could also unmute if you want to. Um, I think you got those four sections down. I'll give it a little bit of wait time. I do have one question. Um, in the assessment area, if the most recent, so we want to only want to include the most recent assessments, correct? However, if it is in complete contradiction or there's enough difference between one assessment to the other, would it make sense to include that as there might have been factors that influence that, right? So if the student scores drop significantly from the last time they were assessed, do you want that added or not? Um, I, I think that that would be an IEP team decision um, because then you would also be basing the rest of the IEP on that evaluation. So if you're if you're seeing significant drops, does that mean that you are then providing, you know, additional goals and are there more needs for the student or, you know, I mean, it, it would be appropriate to keep both and then maybe reference why you're adding goals or not adding goals based off of the information from the two evaluations. Um, Right. So in the written notice of our IAP, annual IEP development, we might have said that these scores are dramatically different and mm -hmm. we're going to use both sets of data to. OK, perfect. Yes, Thank you. Then I think that that would be definitely be appropriate that they're both in that section for a for sure. <clears throat> OK, right. am I taking over? Uh, sure, it's one slide early, but you can go ahead and oh, jump in. Right. Okay. Okay, so this is, we're getting into um, section five. So this is around reporting progress. So just a reminder that um, you need to send home, you know, your progress reports or your progress monitoring of your IEP goals, at least as frequently as the student receives their report cards. So quarterly or trimesterly, however your essay you sends those home. Um, so this goes, we're going to get into um, your goals being measurable and appropriate for students. So this is comes from the Andrew F. versus the Douglas County School District. Um, in that court case, 
where Andrew F. was a student with autism and he attended a school and for several years or a few years, he had the same goals on his IEP. They were just copied and pasted from year to year to year for like three years. Well, then the parents decided to pull him out because he wasn't making any progress and they put him into a private school. And then while he was in that private school, he started to make progress. And so then they took the public school to court and when they took the public school to court the first court that they went to the court sided with the school and said they did what they needed to do merely more than de minimis was the was the kind of the rule at that time and so they did that well then they appealed and they went all the way up to the supreme court and the supreme court sided with the parents and said no this is not okay all students deserve to have appropriately ambitious goals. And they found that the district did not meet its obligation under IDEA. And the Supreme Court said that the school must offer an IEP that is a reasonably calculated, that is reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So, um, making sure that those goals are measurable and attainable for the student. That's where this comes from. And just making sure that we're not copying, pasting from year to year and really making, looking at the data and making sure that those goals are appropriate. Um, here is a link to the Q&A on this court case. It will do a way better job answering your questions and probably explaining it than I did. So feel free to take a look at that. But this is really about use of data in your present levels and your goals. So um, your, you should be using your data very frequently. It should not be something that you just do when you have to do it and then set it aside and go about your, your day. It really should be something that you're using to progress monitor with the students that you're working with to make sure that they are making progress towards their goals that you have designed for them. So it's really about collecting, maintaining that data, analyzing that data, and then, um, you know, looking at your programming to make sure that what you're teaching is allowing that student to make progress. And then it's important to remember that when you're meeting as an IEP team and you're looking at these goals for the student and setting up this program, that they're receiving all of their services that are outlined in the IEP, that appropriate modifications and accommodations are in place for the student, um, and that those measurable IEP goals are there and that they are able to make adequate progress. Because we just, we, we say this, we don't know anything about Andrew F's public school district where he went to school, but we just think if the IEP team had maintained their data, analyzed their data, collected it, and used that to drive his programming, then maybe they wouldn't have been in the situation that they were in, having to go to court around that. Okay, most schools send progress reports mid-reporting period. Am I correct? Those are not required. Correct. Progress reports are not required. It's just when the report card goes home, not progress reports. You're welcome. Okay, so this leads us into section five, where we start looking at the present levels and goals on the IEP. So we're going to talk about the present, the academic present levels first. So the present level is really baseline data of where the student is on that specific skill that you're going to be working on in the goal. So you can see you've got that present level with the baseline data. And then you've got the goal that you're working on and you're using that present level to figure out how much progress you think they're going to make within that year. And then you're using that same data point and that data collection tool to help you do that progress monitoring throughout to make sure that they're making that progress. So it's very important that these present levels must include a clear, concise data point. Because sometimes the present levels we see do have data in them. However, then there are these subjective words thrown in with the data. So leave out those words and just use your data point. So 
um, leave out those words about approximately, at least, less than, greater than, those sorts of words. Trust your data. You know your student best. So if you are saying that your student is working on a skill and they're at 42% accuracy, then that's where they're at. And then you design your skill, your goal to be around that same skill that you have in your present level. And then you just determine how far they're going to get within the year. The PLEP cannot be a grade level. So it really should be around a skill specific measurement or assessment. So you're using, you're measuring a skill specific thing. Just like Ashley said in the section four, you have to pull out those very specific skill deficits. Those skill deficits are what are in your present level because those are what you're writing your goal around. So you want to state that very skill specific measurement. Um, you can do that by using qualitative data through teacher observation, a checklist or daily log, a running record, a work sample. You can use a rubric, but if you reference a rubric in your present level or your goal, you have to attach it to the IEP. It then becomes part of the IEP. So in your present level, do not put any eligibility or evaluation data. This would be... Um, those evaluations are not completed frequently enough in order to use those. State and local assessments are too broad. They have many skills within them. So if you're using those assessments, you're looking at multiple skills and it's not skill specific to your goal. Um, same with grades or report cards in those specific curriculums. And we're going to go through some examples around the specific curriculums when we, when we talk about goals. It is acceptable to say that there is no baseline data yet if the student has not started that particular skill, or you can say they have 0% accuracy or they can do it with 0%, however you word that, um, that is a present level. Um, but in, when you say that they have not yet started something, we take that as like 0%. So you're working up from there. Of data or forgot. So for example, um, for the comprehension piece, I would say, you know, given specially designed instruction, um, oh, sorry, this is present level, just kidding. Like I would say, Johnny is currently reading like a third grade level passage with 60% comprehension. That could be his present level. So you can reference a grade that they're working at, like if they're working at a below grade level reading passage. However, you're not going to um, be in the goal. You're not going to be measuring his progress based on the grade level. You're going to be measuring it based on his percent of that skill of comprehension or decoding. Okay. So in the present level, this is a must fill. So this goes back to that question we had about section four, um, where if you have a student with no academic needs, oops, you still need to fill out that very first present level. This cannot be blank. This is an IDEA requirement. And so if you have a student that has no academic needs and they won't have any academic goals in that very first present level, you just need to put something like they are on grade level with their peers, they have no academic needs, or they're academically commensurate with their peers. And on page 24 in the procedural manual, this goes, it goes over the present level information. So section five, remember that alignment we have talked about a little bit. Um, so when those skills, there are specific skill deficits that were um, listed using your nice bulleted list in section 4C, they need to correspond to a present level in section 5, which then aligns to the goal right below it. So here we can see that there is a present level that Molly can decode CVC words with 45% accuracy. That's where she presently is with that specific skill of decoding CVC words. Now, the goal below it 
is also around that same skill of CVC words. So whenever you have an annual goal, the present level should be directly aligned to that skill in the goal. So, and this is just, um, I mean, I hope that everyone has seen this. This is the kind of the prompt for writing your goals. So you have the by, the given, and the child will, where you put the skill with that level of mastery and then as measured by. So you can see there are some examples. You have that by, what's that date? So it has to be prior to the end of that duration date um, or the same as that duration date. And then given, make sure you put that given with the service. Is it specially designed instruction? Is it consultation? What is it that they are being given that will match to the to section seven on the IEP, the service grid? And then putting that, that skill in there, the child will be able to do that specific skill deficit or they're working on that specific skill deficit and then with that level of mastery and using that data again. Yes, there should be a citation. We're getting right to that with your academic goal. So when you are writing your goals, it's really important to keep the student's needs in mind. So you, you've already identified those skill gaps in section four. So when you go to write your goal, you really shouldn't be writing your goal from the standard. You should be writing your goal from their deficit. So they need to work on decoding CVC words, or they need to work on this math skill of division. However, you write the goal around what the child needs to work on. Then you go to the standards and find the standard that aligns to it as closely as you can. It doesn't have to be perfect and you do not have to pull the wording from the standard. Um, you just need to find a standard that's around that same skill. And then you use that to do your citation. So here's an example of Dan. And he's working on writing a five sentence essay, including an opening sentence, three supporting details, a closing sentence with less than five spelling errors on five out of five assignments. So that was his goal already. That's what they decided, you know, Dan's here, we wanna get him to here. And then they went to the standards and they said, okay, which standard best aligns to this goal I have for Dan? And they decided that in the main learning results, they found it in the writing and it was in that adolescent section of the writing um, in standard number three. So just an example of how you might cite your goals using those standards. And again, this is going to look very familiar because again, that present level um, in the ways that you measure your present level is how you're also going to be measuring your goal. So I'm not going to read through these again, but these are the same thing. You would be using that same measurement tool and using that data point that you had from your present level to help you determine where you're going with your goal. Carly, I can jump in for the pretend reading curriculum because oh, I'm okay. not scared right. of it anymore. I know. Look at that. So we're actually showing some growth here. Um, okay, so we use our pretend reading curriculum to show why we don't um, want you to use a specific curriculum in your goals in or your present levels. Um, and so the example, I like to think of this as I use the FMP all the time as a teacher. And now that I know this, um, why it's too complex uh, to write in this way. So um, for the pretend reading curriculum, we are going to say it level is a level A at the pretend reading curriculum. And in his measurable goal, we want Leo, uh, given specially designed instruction, to move from a level A to a level B in the pretend reading curriculum. So uh, why is this problematic? For a number of reasons. Number one, if he were to go to another um, district or another classroom or something that didn't have access to that specific curriculum, they wouldn't be able to carry out the IEP. Number two, um, because you guys aren't familiar with the pretend le reading curriculum, you don't know that level A is encompassing these skills. So in level A, we would expect that he will learn 19 basic consonant sounds, high frequency sight words 1 to 25, and segmenting simple CVC words. And then to get to level B, we would need to teach him vowel sounds, high frequency sight words 26 to 40, and segmenting simple CCVC words. So 
that is multiple skills in each of those levels. So what you're going to do, you can still use those curriculums that you have, but you're just going to pull those specific skills out. So um, if we are, if we have a student who's working on a level B in the curriculum that we're using, pull out those specific skills and write the goals around those specific skills. So the IEP team looked at level A for Leo and they decided that they wanted him to be able to segment CVC words with 80% accuracy and um, identify 19 of uh, nine, <laughs> 19 of 19 basic consonant sounds um, with 100% accuracy. So just pull out those specific skills from the curriculum and um, write in your present level reference where they are specifically for that skill and where you'd like them to get. Um, and again, just one skill per goal. So not the multiple skills that it would require to go from level A to level B in one goal. All right. And then for your functional present levels, again, it's the same thing. You just must include that data. So take out that subjective language. Don't use those ranges. Give us the specific data point of where the student is performing that skill. So that just enables your progress monitoring, as Carly said, with academics. Um, and again, the functional present level is a must fill. So if you have a student who's only receiving academic support, you just need to open that first functional goal. And in that present level, you can use that same language of has no functional needs, is functionally commensurate with peers. Um, it just can't be blank. So IDEA, IDEA says that this is a must fill. So that first present level has to have something in there. Um, this is referenced further in the procedural manual on page 26. And um, hold on, let me just read that. Um, for reading skills, the baseline for skills would be Sorry, this chat box uh, would be reflected in percentage or opportunities. Sounds like those are the only two baseline points. There you go. Did you say me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, it's whatever. So whatever that tool is that you're using to collect that data to see where they are presently with that skill, that would be how you're measuring it. Um, so, I mean, typically for me, I would think about it as percentages. Um, if you're doing like sight words, we, oh, it's not on this one, but we've had one, maybe it comes up later. We've had an example where it's like they can read 22 out of you know the 120 sight words and we want them to get to 50 out of the 120 sight words, something like that. But usually there is a percent accuracy or uh, something out of something, something opportunities. So those are the pretty typical measurements, yeah. All right, and then for your functional goals, again, that format that Carly just showed you, just following that same uh, functional that same format of by given the service um, and just again one more plug to make sure that you put the specially designed instruction or the consultation in there for the given for that alignment piece um, and then you do not have to align your functional and developmental goals to the standards um, but just make sure you follow that same um, format. And we're going to do a little test, but first, uh, okay, looks like, yes, this the citation in the last section of how it will be measured. Yep. All right. And then let's do a little practice round here. So section five, that's your present level. So we have Jennifer. Gem Jennifer demonstrates the ability to rhyme less than 70% of the time. And why would that be non-compliant? Yep, there's that less than, exactly. So less than 70% is a huge um, possibility. She could be at 20%, she could be at 68%, um, just that less than point. So we need a specific data point. And there's an example of 
what it could look like. Jennifer demonstrates the ability to rhyme one syllable patterns with 42% accuracy. So just again, that very specific data point, no subjective so, link. I have a question on that and, and um, bear with me for a minute. So I, I've always been a firm believer that you, you can't do certain things partially correct, right? Like you can't, you can't solve math problems at 80% accuracy because then it's wrong. So isn't like, isn't the, isn't it better or it doesn't matter to you all? Um, Carly can rhyme, accurately rhyme or independently and accurately rhyme one syllable words in four out of five presented problem sets, right? So it's like, you know, or one out of five. So it's 20% accurate. I mean, 20% of the time she can do it accurately, but how can you rhyme? How can you partially rhyme something? <laughs> well, it's, it's out. So this is a percentage. So it would be, so when I think of 80%, I have to use round numbers when I do percentages, 80% would be like eight out of 10 times. Right, so, but I, so of the eight of the eight times she's doing it accurately, a hundred percent. Right, you can't partially rhyme. So it's okay. like, so you, if I think of like rhyme and time, I can't say that Tim. You know what I mean? Like it's not. Then it's not accurate. I guess it doesn't matter. I, it doesn't make sense to me. Like math, you can't you can't partially. It's not a partial. Math is either right or wrong, and so. But I guess it doesn't matter to you folks if it's, it's in that the implication is that she does it. I mean, it's like opportunities. So it would be like saying yeah. she's able to do it with on eight out of 10 opportunities. Instead, I just turned it into a percentage and I said she can do it with 80 percent accuracy, because if you give her like a worksheet with 10 examples and she gets eight of them mm -hmm. correct, then she gets yeah. an 80 percent on that skill or she's done it correctly eight out of 10 opportunities with 100%, right? So you you would not be opposed to it being worded the way that I wrote, wrote it, right? So she can accurately rhyme six of 10 opportunities, which would be 60%. Right. No, right? But each of the opportunities she does correctly, she does 100%. Right. Right. If you okay. wanted to say with okay. 100, and you don't even have to say with 100%, but I get what you're saying is okay. they have to do it with okay. 100% on six out of 10 opportunities right. okay. how, yes okay mm -hmm. Thank yeah you. however yep. you want to word that mm -hmm. okay a good question though just uh sometimes that trips people up yes for the compliance piece of things it, however it works for you as long as it's measurable and you know obviously understandable to us and it aligns to the present level is what we're looking at so all right one more question i wish it was ex as exciting as this picture makes it seem that's an exciting picture but uh okay looking at section five we have a present level for mary mary can decode cvc words with 55 to 70 percent accuracy and then in her goal we are mary will improve her reading comprehension using a third grade text from a standard score of 72 to 80 as measured by data collection so why isn't this compliant Yep, we've got that 50 to 70% range. The present level does not match the goal. You are right. And that's right. There's no alignment. And there, there's a range. Exactly. You guys got it exactly right. This goal always, this example always freaks me out. There's a, so much going on in it. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> it, it's, it's a messy like... one for sure. And they tricked even me there with no citation, although maybe it's in there in the... Um, chat but yeah so the data point in the present level is arranged the present level does not align with the goal the measurement references standard scores and then there's no standard in the goal and you're right it's measured by the woodcock Johnson. so all right great job and instead, what we will see is that Mary can decode CVC words with 62% accuracy. That's her present level. And then given specially designed instruction, Mary will decode CVC words. There's that alignment for the skill and with 80%. So there's alignment in the measurement and it's measured by work samples, data collection, teacher observation or similar. All of those are acceptable measurement tools. And you've got your main learning results citation there. Um, so the third grade level, um, as long as that's referencing the material, yes, just not the measurement. So if you're saying that she's reading a third grade 
level work sample, that is okay. Um, if you were to say she's reading on third grade level, that is would not be compliant. Um, or similar, that might mean um, a teacher made data sheet that could um, be used specifically in the classroom, um, could be, well, I'm not sure what other examples might be for similar. Carly yeah, got I think me. It's, I think it's just similar to those. So like work samples, data collection, teacher observation, or similar. So I think it's referring to any of those three. If they went somewhere else and maybe they used a different tool to measure the skill, they're just saying you could use something similar to these things. It doesn't have to be exactly these things. Gotcha. Do you expect that statement in there? Like, is that uh, to keep it? No, it doesn't need to be there. Nope. Okay. All right. Do we have an, oh, look at that. It's the best time, you guys. It's a five minute break. Um, citations are not needed for functional goals. So again, those are just for the academic goals. Yep. All right. So we're going to take a little five minute break and we will see you guys back here in five minutes will get rolling again just because like we said this is a longer um training so we have that five minute break and so we are going to move on all right and we are going to get into the very tricky topic of outcome-based goals and how to avoid those outcome-based goals um, when we are thinking of outcomes as those age-appropriate expectations, those are the things we want all students to be able to do. So when we're thinking of academic outcome-based goals, it's really those age-appropriate expectations of reading or being able to do math or writing on grade level. So instead of writing your goal around the outcome or that age appropriate expectation, it's really important to think about the skill deficit that you, that the student has in the skill that you're going to be teaching to overcome that skill deficit in order to reach that outcome. So you're really thinking, what are we going to teach them? So we have a little case study here with Eli for our academic example. Um, and you've seen maybe, maybe not. I get my trainings mixed up. But anyway, so this is Eli. Eli is in first grade and he's been identified with an SLD in reading or a specific learning disability in reading. Um, the team has identified that he has a specific skill deficit in his fluent letter identification. And so you can see his how statement says that the skill gaps in this area impact Eli's ability, ability to participate in literacy activities with same age peers. So because he is struggling with fluent letter identification, he's not able to do those literacy activities. And so instead of saying that he'll be able to read on grade level or do those literacy activities on grade level for his goal, the goal is going to be around that very skill specific deficit of fluent letter identification. So you can see his present level is that he'll be able to identify 17 of the 26 alphabet letters. And then his goal is that given specially designed instruction, he will expressively identify all 26 letters in the alphabet. So it's really about pulling out those specific skills that will get to that outcome. So we want him to be able to read at the first grade level, but he's not able to do that. Instead of saying that, we're, we're, we're identifying that skill that he will be working on in order to get to that outcome. Some other examples of reading on grade level might be the student needs to work on fluency or spelling or phonemic awareness. This is really where you're working with your team to help determine what those specific needs are for that student within the year. All right, so now we're going to get to the, we call it the trickier part, the functional um, goal writing, where we want to avoid those outcome goals and write goals that are more around those skills that you're working on to get to those outcomes. So here are some examples of those functional outcome-based goals. 
Um, these are what we expect all students to be able to do. So we want everyone to increase attendance or increase their work completion or decrease, decrease those unwanted behaviors like aggression, biting, bolting, um, increase safety, increased attention to tasks. So these are the, some examples of those outcomes and you wanna stay away from those topics in your goals. Instead, you wanna focus on the skills that will help reach those outcomes. So here's Jane. Jane's in third grade and has been identified with OHI due to ADD. And the team has identified that she has deficits in her ability to self-initiate. And you can see in the house statement that it kind of tells you what the outcome is. This impacts her ability to maintain attention and complete assigned tasks. So they want her to pay attention and they want her to complete her work. But she's not able to do that because the team has decided it's because she can't get started. She can't self-initiate. So instead of writing a goal around work completion or maintaining attention, they're going to write the goal around those self-initiation skills. So you can see in the present level, right now, she's able to show those self-initiation skills um, by starting work tasks within 12 minutes in 100% of opportunities. And then in the goal, given specially designed instruction, Jane will demonstrate increased self-initiation skills by starting work tasks within five minutes with less than two adult prompts in 80% of opportunities as measured by data collection and teacher observation. So what we're seeing sometimes now that we've been doing a lot of training to this type of goal writing is that people are getting like, we call it halfway there. So they're writing their goal around that skill, saying that Jane will demonstrate increased self-initiation skills, but then they're measuring the outcome. And so instead of measuring the being able to increase their self-initiation skills using the starting work tasks, you know, in however many opportunities, they're saying something like increase self-initiation skills by completing 80% of her work. So they're still measuring that outcome of work completion, but they're saying that she's working on these self-initiation skills. So when you're writing these type of goals that are around that skill-specific deficit, make sure that you're measuring the skill. So we're going to see a couple more examples, but here's Jane. We want her to complete work. That's her outcome. So we're teaching her self-initiation. So then we're going to meet Nina. And this is, Nina is in first grade and has been, it, been identified with autism. The team has decided that Nina has skill deficits in her ability to request help in situations that are challenging for her. And again, you can see in her house statement, that outcome comes out in her house statement. This impacts her ability to engage socially with peers in ways that are not aggressive. So Nina is aggressive. So instead of writing a goal around we want her to reduce aggressions. We're writing the goal around the skill that we're teaching her that we're hoping will reduce aggressions, and that is requesting help. So the goal, her present level, starts with prompted by an adult, she can pick up a help card, reach and release to a partner in 100% of opportunities. In the goal, Nina will independently pick up the help card, reach and release to the partner, when presented with situations that required her to do so in 70% of opportunities. And you can see that from the present level to the goal, the um, measurement went down. However, that's because the rigor increased because in the present level, that's being prompted by an adult. Now we're asking her to do it independently. Um, and you can also see in the goal, it says, as measured by data collection, teacher observation, and reduced aggressions. So we know that you are not going to stop tracking your aggressions and whether they're reducing, and that's okay because you want to know if this skill that you're teaching Nina is working. So you should still be monitoring and um, collecting data on whether or not those aggressions are reducing with this new skill being taught. So we you want her to reduce her aggressions, and we're going to teach her to request help. Yeah, question? 
Yeah. So around the self-initiation piece. So the question is that is self-initiation an outcome? Wouldn't there be strategies that Jane needed to be taught for self-initiation? So um, skill-based goals can be like it's never ending. We could really get into the weeds with this because yes, I mean, you could say that, but when you're thinking about that outcome of where you want her to get, you want her to be able to complete her work. And the thing that's getting in her way, the skill that she needs to learn is self-initiation and getting started with her work. So you really have to think about that student and just, um, and how it works for them. If it really is something that you're asking everybody to do, or is this something student specific? So you could get, I mean, we could technically say everything is an outcome. Um, so it it's really hard when we start talking about these things, but really thinking about what you're teaching them. That's what you really should focus on. What's that skill that I'm teaching? And if you're teaching her to use a timer to get started or however, then that is the skill that you would write your goal around. And then one more question in the chat about, um, is there a reason not to use the present level as the student's ability to do it without adult support? No, there is no reason that was, you could do it that way. You could say they, it's at 0% or they haven't started it. But in this case, it was just, um, it was chosen that the present level was with prompted by an adult. And then it was going to the more rigorous of independently. Okay. So now we're going to look at Lewis. And Lewis is in fourth grade and has been identified with an emotional disturbance. Lewis has skill deficits in his ability to read and follow a schedule. That's what the team has determined. And this impacts his ability to attend school and participate in all daily activities across his day. So this is a student where they're really trying to increase his attendance, but that is an outcome goal. We want everyone to attend school. So instead of writing the goal around increasing his attendance, we're writing it around that skill that we think will help him increase his attendance, which is following a visual schedule. And so the present level is that when presented with a schedule that outlines activities, Lewis can identify first then in 18% of opportunities. And his goal is that he will independently respond to a visual first then board by transitioning between two presented activities with 50% accuracy. So again, this is that outcome of we want to increase his attendance. So that skill that the team worked together and said, okay, well, let's see if he uses a first then board, if that will help increase his attendance. And again, you may put as measured by data collection, teacher observation, and increased attendance, because again, you are going to keep track of, is this skill working and really something that is helpful in him getting to that outcome of increased attendance. So just remember you're teaching that skill that helps the student reach the outcome um, and you're writing your goal around that skill rather than around that outcome or that age appropriate expectation. Some other possible skill deficit areas that you can think about. We have, we saw the example of requesting help when there are communication deficits, but you could also think about um, other skills you may want to work on is requesting a break or requesting a preferred item. Um, then we saw the first then, but maybe you were talking about a goal with where you're teaching them calming activities. If they're impulsive, maybe they're usually using a visual schedule or a visual timer, or they're learning those self-control, self-regulation tools. Um, if they need to work on organization, maybe they're using a planner or to-do list. So these are just some possible things that you may be teaching them in order to get to those outcomes of, you know, um, decreasing their anxiety or decreasing their impulsivity, things like that. And again, I've kind of touched on this, but remember that even though you're working on the skill and the goal, you're still progress monitoring and seeing if that skill is helping with reducing that outcome. I, I say reducing because this is around that reducing aggressions. So, or increasing attendance. So you're still keeping data on that outcome, but the goal is written around the skill that you're teaching the student. And on page 26 of the procedural manual, 
it talks about this a little bit. And are there any other questions about the skill versus outcome goals? This is a very hard concept. Every one of us on the team was a special ed teacher and we all wrote outcome goals. So we are, we have learned and now we're trying to teach. We did not do this when we were teaching. I, well, I can speak for myself. I did not write these goals when I was teaching. I now write them for, for examples. <laughs> <laughs> so we get that it's a, it's a hard thing. Okay. Well, if questions come up, feel free to interject or drop them in chat. And you can always reach out to us too. We gave our contact information at the beginning and we'll give it again at the end. But we always say, if you have questions about goals or anything on the IEP, you can always send us hypotheticals. You can say, hey, I've written this goal. I'm not really sure if it's outcome or if it's skill-based. Can you take a look at it? As long as you don't put it like from the IEP, don't send us anything from the IEP and don't send us any student identifying information. And we will be happy to give you feedback about any parts of your IEP, but especially those goals. Okay. I think we've done pretty good keeping up with the chat box. Yeah, we just got one question dropped in there now. So yep. um, yeah. this seems like probably a good time for that, a little check-in. I think so. Okay. Awesome. Um, so <laughs> I always tease a colleague when she always says back in the day, <laughs> I've been at this special ed thing for a long time. Um, and, and you just, it was when you mentioned how, when you, we were all teachers, right. And writing goals. And mm -hmm. so back in the day, and I, maybe you all were in the same place, uh, I'm struggling with what main, I don't even know how to say this. Like on the front page, it used to be that when you read the front page of an IEP, you would walk away with this robust picture of this kid, right? You would know their history. You would know all the complexities that this kid brings to the academic setting. And now we're being instructed to have um, the, uh, the front page be aligned to the goals and to the services. Because mm -hmm. in reality, if we were to include on the front page, everything about what is this student brings to the table, their IEP would be 75 pages long with a hundred goals, right? Right. Um, but so I'm missing that piece. I'm missing like when I get an IEP from another school, transfer IEP, and, and Maine Virtual Academy gets uh, 75 new IEPs at the start of the school year, right? We take in about 75 new special education students in the fall. So mm -hmm. it's hard to not have that robust look at the kid. So mm -hmm. my question more is, and so that was my comments. So my question is, why why are we... Why are we heading in that direction? I mean, I, I totally get where the goals and services need to align, but where am I now going to get that robust picture of the kid if it's not in the IEP? Because I certainly don't have the time to read every single written notice. And even the written notices don't give you that robust picture of the kid. So back in the day, when I read that front page, I'd be like, oh, I get this kid. I know, I, I have a sense of how to service this kid. I don't have that anymore. So does anybody else feel that way? And can can we think about how we might do differently? <laughs> we, I, I feel like I've heard that comment quite a bit actually. And mm -hmm. we do say, unfortunately, that the written notice is where you document all of that other stuff. And mm -hmm. I don't know where the, where the decision came from to streamline the IEP unless it was just um, to get it more in compliance with IDEA law um, mm -hmm. and just put those pieces that are necessary. Um, but yes, I we do get that. People want to put all of that information in the IEP. And we, unfortunately, we do just have to keep saying, that's something that you would put in the written notice for people to know. And the IEP really is about their education plan and the services that they need within the next year and, um, you know, and having those goals. And so just keeping it very minimal to what they're working on 
within a year. And all of those extras would be in the written notice. I know it's not fantastic, um, but it, yeah, it, it it I wanted I wanted to put the question and the comment out there so that it was one recorded for others that I because I've heard this. Um, and so my follow up question is: Are you suggesting that this is a federal requirement? Because I can't find the federal citation that says the front page can't be what it used to be. So I'd like, and I'm not questioning you. I'm, I would, I just want to learn. So if you can direct me to where I'd find that, it'd be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know okay. what the reasoning was behind that change in the form of the IEP. Um, okay. I do know that there is an IEP committee and that they are working on updates to a new IEP form. And there are some changes that will be made, but I don't know exactly what they entail. Great. So Thank you very I can, much. I appreciate I the honesty. Yeah, I can bring the yeah. question back to the team because, you know, they, some of them have been on the team longer than Ashley and I. And so they may know the history of that revamping of the IEP. So yeah. I can definitely. I, my ask. school actually has a one on one meeting with Colette uh, this Thursday. And oh, it is a question being asked by her. So mm -hmm. of her at that time. So, uh, but okay. I, I just wanted to throw it out there. Again, one, because it's being recorded, and I think other people are asking that question. And so I just yeah. wanted to throw it yeah. there. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, so just reviewing the um, section five. So we're taking a look at these goals. Um, so if you take a look at Margaret's goal here, it says Margaret will demonstrate reading skills at the fifth grade level as measured by data collection, teacher observation, work samples, or similar citation here. I think somebody got lazy and was tired of putting in the actual citations. <laughs> uh, so tell us in the chat box why this is not compliant. What is wrong with this goal? I think we're focusing on the goal, but you can tell us the present level too, if you want to, because that is not a great present level. Right. Yep. Exactly. You guys got it. So it's grade level. This is an age appropriate expectation. Um, this is one of those outcome academic goals, right? So, and it's too broad. It doesn't have any of those specific skills we're looking for. And yeah, it's not measurable. Okay. So instead, we now have Margaret demonstrating reading fluency of 37% when presented a third grade reading passage. And so notice that the skills on that reading fluency and, but they're still use, saying that they're using that third grade passage. So given specially designed instruction, Margaret will demonstrate reading fluency of 80% when presented with a third grade reading, reading passage. So yeah, making sure you get that skill in there. Let's try another one. This is a functional goal and present level. So again, if you notice anything in the goal or present level, um, tell us why it's not compliant. This is Jeffrey demonstrates aggressive behavior 64% of his day. Jeffrey will reduce aggressive behaviors to 15% of his day as measured by teacher observation and data collection. So tell us, why is that not compliant? Right, what skills are we teaching him to reduce that aggression? aggress aggression aggression yeah so this is an outcome based excellent job you guys are we're listening that's great and uh so we want all students to be not aggressive um and so we really want to focus on that skill deficit so this is jeffrey and they've decided that to reduce those aggressions that skill they're going to work on is taking a break so when presented with situations that require Jeffrey to take a break before becoming aggressive, he will exchange the break card with a partner with 19% accuracy. And then the goal is that given specially designed instruction when presented with situations that require Jeffrey to take a break, he will independently exchange the break card with a partner with 50% accuracy as measured by teacher observation, data collection, and reduced aggressions. Because again, they're doing that, they're working on that skill, they're teaching him to use that break card, and they're measuring his ability to use the break card, but they're also keeping track to see if those aggressions will reduce. 
Okay. And then this is just a reminder that if you are teaching supports that help a student to be successful, make sure to include those tools in section six of the IEP under the accommodations. So you can see here that um, this kiddo has a sensory toolkit and they have things like a help card, a break card, a squishy, and a first then board. So if you're writing these goals around those skills that you're teaching, just remember to put those tools that will be necessary um, because they want to be able to access them throughout their school day, not just in that special education setting when you're doing that specific instruction. All right, and then we get this question a lot from related service providers around the outcome versus skill. And so they're saying like improved communication would be your outcome because we get a lot around articulation. Do I have to do a new goal for every sound that I'm working on? And the answer is no. The communication is that outcome for students. You wanna improve their communication skills. And then each skill deficit that helps improve the communication would be those skills that you work on. So articulation could be a goal in, a, in and of itself, and then expressive language would could be another goal, and receptive language. And if you put expressive and receptive language together, that would be multiple skills. So just remember to separate out those different skills into separate goals. All right. Another chat box check-in. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, a couple popped in. Carly. Okay. Uh, if a district has made a decision to write objectives with their goals, even if not taken on, they would not need to cite them. Correct. You do not need to cite the objectives unless the student is taking the alternate assessment. Speech and language goals. Always listen to Carly, you guys. <laughs> Speech and language goals do not need to have a standard attached to them because they're a functional goal. So only the academic goals need a citation or standard linked to them. What was that? Okay. All right. Section six. Um, these are the supplementary aid services, modifications, and or supports or accommodations. Um, so in this section, you want to make sure that you list anything that the student would need with, throughout their school day. I know I just talked about if you have it in a goal, make sure it's in section six. However, if you put it in section six, it does not need to be in a goal. It doesn't have to go both ways. Um, this section can be things that they use, but they're not necessarily listed in the other parts of the IEP. And here is that example of that ILAP, that Individual Language Acquisition Plan. I think I was close on getting what those letters stood for. Um, so if you have an ILAP, you could note that here. And when you're filling out Section 6, just remember that if you put something in the left-hand column, you have to fill out the row completely. So make sure you check off those appropriate boxes in that second column. Um, and really be thoughtful about that. Don't just go through and check off every single box for every single accommodation that you put in there because some of them are not appropriate for, let's say, the assessment. Um, but yeah, so be mindful when you're checking those off and then just make sure you fill out that location, the frequency, and then that duration, which typically is the duration of the IEP, but it could change depending on if you dropped an accommodation or added one. Is it customary uh, and or acceptable? We received a couple IEPs this year that had in this section um, access to a speech and language pathologist uh, for social pragmatics practice. <laughs> or, you know, like it was very strange because then it, it, it implied a service that the student had a speech and language for social pragmatics challenge, which they do. I mean, we ended up giving them the related service of speech and language, but it was in this section. And this was the first time I've ever seen it in there. Oh. Um, I think that that would be appropriate. I would have to double, double check with the rest of the team, but um, 
because when we talk about consult and we'll get to that in a little bit, but if you're not, if you do not have a goal that you wouldn't want to put the service on the service grid in section seven. So if that speech and language person really um, didn't have a goal that they were working on with that student and it was more of just a check-in, then it would be appropriate to put on the accommodations page rather than it was, having it. It wasn't listed seven. as a consult though. It said access to for, for social pragmatics practice. So how Correct. would you practice it if it wasn't? Okay. So, okay. You would, yeah, you wouldn't want to put a consult on section six. Consult is in right. section seven, but if you're right, if it's not attached to a goal, then it really isn't a consult. It would be more like a collaboration or just a check in. And so then you would put that in section six. <clears throat> Carly, before we move on, look, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Are you checking those out? I was looking. So okay. I don't know where I I don't know where I landed uh, though. Lena is I think it's Lena is the first one that we haven't addressed yet. Just that if the standard is different isn't different from the overall goal for the objectives, does the standard need the citation need to be repeated? Um, I yes, repeat it if the student is taking the alternate assessment. I would just put it yes, repeat it. And then Katie's, I'll let you read Katie's. If a just... service provider writes a goal, social worker and does not want anything else. Um, I, I am not sure what the practice is at your SAU. Um, I would, it would be recommended that the related service provider, and in this case, the social worker, for example, um, be given some training or access to the trainings that talk about these regulations and help them, uh, comply with the regulations so that they can write their goals in the way that you need them to so that that case manager doesn't have to go back and fix or make them compliant you know so giving the social worker that information would be the best way to do that i would think the person responsible so ML, uh, say regular ed is the person responsible. So the ML, that would be the language piece, I'm assuming, the multilingual learner. And there is no person responsible on the section six. So I'm not sure if you're talking about in section seven for that question, but regular ed cannot be a person responsible. So it would have to be the certified teacher or certified related service provider. I meant the um, location. Sorry, Carly. Oh, okay. I was like, what? yes, it can just say regular ed. Yes. Thank you for that. I was a little bit confused. I don't know why I couldn't figure that out on my own. That would have made sense. So by regular teacher, that accommodation. So accommodations can be made for any students at any time, even without an IEP or 504. It's just when they are documented in an IEP or 504, then they are required to be uh, followed and used as they are documented. So it's just good teaching if the people are using accommodations without being told that they have to use them on an I from an IEP or 504 plan. Receives academic support, can that be an accommodation? Academic support, can that be an accommodation? Will be taught in a, taught a skill during academic support, it would be a service, but if it's general support and service support, Yes, it could be an accommodation. It could be an accommodation that they access that setting to go work on a large project when needed to. Um, 
and correct it would be if they're working on a specific skill in a goal, then that would be a service. Yes. But if they're just going out to work on something on an as needed basis, that would be an accommodation. Oh, great. Thank you, Sandra, for sharing that. Good. I'm glad that they're working with you to make those goals appropriate for the IEP. Great. All right. Okay, so just a little clarification around uh, section six with an accommodation versus a modification. An accommodation changes how the student learns the material, where the modification changes what a student is taught or expected to learn. So just an example of a modification mean, could mean a change in that regular education curriculum or assessment to lower the standards um, of that curriculum for the student where an accommodation may mean a change in the manner in which they're presented that information, such as a book. Instead of reading it on their own, they're able to listen to that same material and get the same instruction and information just by listening versus having to read it on their own. And then just here's an example of that uh, conversation about the consultation, that's the word I was looking for, versus collaboration. So consultation would go in section seven of the IEP, but if you put it in section seven, it has to be aligned to a goal. So it would say given consultation or given OT consultation, given speech consultation, whatever it is, and then it would be attached to a goal, which is still written around a specific skill that you're working on with the student just in a less restrictive environment. But if you're like, well, I'm not really working on a skill with the student anymore. I just want to make sure he's doing okay before I dismiss him. Well, then that would go on section six as an accommodation. And you could put it as a collaboration or a check-in. Goals cannot be maintenance goals. They, When you are writing a consultation go goal, it has to be a specific skill, just like any other goal. It cannot be to maintain grades or maintain passing grades or maintain something like that. It has to be around that specific skill. And the procedural manual actually talks about on page 27 that you could call this consult, uh, collaboration whoop, under other. So this is just an example of a regular education teacher and an occupational therapist collaboration. Um, so they are checking in to see how the student is doing, but there's no goal attached to that. And then also that goes for any educational um, te ed techs or BHPs um, that may be supporting a student. Those could be documented here in section six. Um, that also goes for related service provider assistance, <clears throat> such as CODAs or speech assistants. Um, you would not put them on the service grid, but if you want to document that they are working with a student, that you you can put them in section six. Okay, now we're going to talk about 6B. This is where you look at and decide as a team if the student will be taking the alternate assessment. This is a screenshot of that participation decision flow chart that it talks about in section six. And this can be find, found on our website at this link. This will bring you to the participate, participate. Oh my word, I cannot say that word. I did this yesterday too, okay? So, you know, if they want to participate in the alternate assessment, wow. Um, and then you would use that with the team if you're considering alternate assessment. 6B cannot be left blank. This is a must fill. So you have to check one of these, yes, no, or NA. If you check yes, then um, that the child will take the alternate assessment, then you have to include an explanation here. <clears throat> and that means that the student's academic goals require objectives. Um, okay, I think that's the same thing. And then here is, the, oh, this is the link to those alternate academic achievement standards. So there are these AAAAs, and you can find them at this link. 
Um, they're also called the core content connectors. So it's a little bit confusing because we talk about them as the alternate academic achievement standards, but then when you go to the website, they're actually labeled as core content connectors. And that's where you'll find those standards that you will um, use in your citation, in your objectives, and in your goal. So here is an example of a student that is going to take the alternate assessment. This is Lily, and Lily will participate in conversations and express her own thoughts in eight out of 10 opportunities per week as measured by teacher observation. In this CC, SL, excuse me, is the citation to the core content connectors. And so that's the goal. And then the objectives are have just taken that same skill and broken it down into uh, smaller chunks. So the overall goal is due by November. So they're saying that by February, given the SDI and reading that she'll be able to do this in six out of 10 opportunities. And then in May, she'll be able to do that with seven out of 10 opportunities. And then within that year, she'll get to the eight out of 10. So they've just broken it down into smaller chunks. <clears throat> okay, so con if it's, uh, so, Okay, so consultation goals, those are all individualized. So you could take any goal that you have for a student and um, really, and you can identify, uh, let's see, I did one the other day, I'm trying to think of it. So this person was saying that they were at with, they were able to do a skill with 95% accuracy um, given direct instruction. So that was like the present level. And then the goal was that given <clears throat> consultation and a less restrictive environment of the general ed setting, that they would be able to do that same skill with 95% accuracy. So they were showing the change in setting so that they were still um, measuring that same skill, just whether they were able to transfer it over to that less restrictive setting of the general ed environment. Um, okay. So the collaboration, that depends. Um, obviously, if collaboration is in section six, you would need to have a direct service on the service grade in section seven for the student to still be eligible for IEP services. So if it was your only service and you were trying to move it to collaboration in section six, then that would not work. Um, and you may want to revisit whether the student really needs to have that as a service. Um, in that case, you would have to figure out what the student really needed to work on in to have a service in section seven and a goal aligned to that. There is no preference using objectives versus just goals. Some people like to have the goal and then it broken down into objectives. Others do not, they just want the, the goal. The only time it's required is when the student is taking the alternate assessment. If the student is taking the alternate assessment, the objectives need to be cited as well as the goal. If you have a student that is not taking the alternate, alternate assessment, but you have just decided that you want to have a goal with objectives, the objectives do not need to have a citation. Only the goal needs a citation. Whether you check yes, I mean, whether you check no or NA in 6B, if I go back here, yeah. So because this can't be blank and you're like, I don't know if I should check no or NA, that is a 
your decision as an IEP team or uh, SAU. Some said, I, I've heard from some that not applicable would be the students that aren't even eligible to take those assessments yet, like the K to two kiddos, or um, they just put NA for everybody that they don't consider for an alternate assessment, or they put no for anyone they wouldn't consider. That's your decision. Um, I'm going to get clarification around if we have to use the alternate standards to link for students taking the alternate assessment. I believe that you do, but I am going to get confirmation of that. Because the idea is that those alternate assessments are the um, common core and or main learning results that have been um, adjusted to their level um, for the, those students in the 1% that, um, so it's working on the same skills, but just in a different way. So I think that's the idea is that if they're taking the alternate assessment, you would use those standards, but I will get a confirmation on that. Okay, I think I got everything in the chat box. All right, section seven is around the uh, special ed and related services. So this is where you put all of the services that the child is receiving. And just a reminder that the child's needs drive the services in their frequencies, not the school or program schedule. And not to pick on middle school or high school, but this is just, we typically see it at that age level because that's where we see more block scheduling. Um, and so we just want you to think about this. If you are a school that does block scheduling and you have a study hall from nine to 10, and so you have it broken up into a special ed study hall and a general ed study hall, and you're saying that the student is going to come, that the student needs 30 minutes per week of reading comprehension during that hour block, then it would not be appropriate to put or to have them pulled out for that full hour of that study hall, because at the time the IEP team determined that really they only need 30 minutes out of that 60 minutes. So one way to um, have this set up is that once they're finished working on their goals related to that specially designed instruction on their service grid, then they would be given the opportunity to go back to the general education setting. Now, if it's a if it's documented in section six as an accommodation that they choose to stay in that special ed setting, then they can stay beyond their frequency noted in section seven. However, that needs to be documented in section six as an accommodation for them that they choose to stay. Because if they are done their work after 30 minutes and they're like, okay, I want to go back to my class. And you're like, no, it's not done. Then that would be, um, you know, over servicing them. So you don't want to do that. And then just a reminder that on the service grid, each of those sections, each of those columns is a must fill. So you must fill out the position responsible, the location, the frequency and that duration. Um, those positions are those certified special educators or the licensed related service providers. No regular ed teachers or general ed teachers or ed techs or assistants, anything like that. Um, the location would be special ed, general ed, or both. You can do the frequency however you want to document that, as long as everyone in the IEP team understands what that looks like, including the parent. And then those duration dates, just making sure to adjust the ESY dates so that it's only for your summer ESY time, because if you do it for the duration of the IEP, then um, that would, the expectation would be that you would do those uh, over other breaks, such as February break or April break or through winter break. And then speech and language <clears throat> is only a direct special ed service, so it would only be on the top if it is a child with a speech and language impairment, either by itself or part of a multiple, 
or if the child has been identified with autism and speech and language is the only service that they're receiving. Yes, Samantha, I will send out an email with that clarification after. So if you request a contact hour certificate at the end of this, then when I set, when I email those, I will put the response when I get clarification in that email. Mm, that's a great question. We're going to touch on that in just a second. Colby, I will get to it. So here is that consultation slide that I was referring to earlier. So this is really making sure that those skills that the student has developed in that specially designed instruction or more restrictive setting in the uh, special ed setting is being carried over to that less restrictive setting. And so if you have consultation in section seven of the IEP, it needs to be aligned to a goal. So you need to have that given consultation or given specially designed instruction and OT consultation or something like that. Um, so it does have to be aligned to a goal. And if not, then consider maybe it is an accommodation and it's really collaboration between the adults to make sure that things are going okay for the student. Um, section seven, when you have those content areas such as social studies, science, or health, they are not listed on the service grid. So you're not going to write your goals around any of those content areas. However, if they require support, then the specially designed instruction would be around that specific skill deficit that you've identified. So for example, if there is a student that is receiving history, um, special ed instruction for their history classes, it's really probably around the fact that they're having trouble decoding that text or with that reading comprehension. So that is the skill that would be, that you would write your goal around are those reading comprehension or the decoding or being able to, you know, write those papers or whatnot for that written expression, the organization, things like that. Um, and the SDI would be around those. So it would be around reading or math or writing. You would not list those content areas. And then this is just an example of you can either break it out. So maybe a student is receiving reading in the special ed setting part of their day, and then they're also receiving some other instruction in both the special ed and general ed setting for part of their day. You can write them out separately to identify that, or you can put them together, combining the times and putting both settings together. <clears throat> so that is the IEP team's decision on how they want to document that. And just remember that every service needs a goal and every goal needs a service. There needs to be that alignment. Okay, so it's quiz time again. So let's take a look at this service grid. We've got some specially designed instruction for reading comprehension and for some science. We've got the position responsible, the location, the frequency, and the duration. Are you noticing anything there that is not compliant? Right, science, definitely, excellent, should not be there. Yep, duration, somebody caught the duration. Very good, <laughs> yes. So you would not provide SDI in science. You want to, because they do not have a disability in science, it's really around that in this case, reading comprehension. And the dates should be uh, run within those 364 days. So it shouldn't go until 11-2, it should be at least 11-1. Good. All right. Oh, and here's the example. So you would write it around reading comprehension and then change those dates or that date. All right, here's another one. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've got Specially designed instruction for reading fluency. We've got position responsible, location, frequency, duration. Take a look at those. And then we've got extended school year, speech and language. Oh, I see things popping into chat rapidly. Right, exactly. EdTech is not the responsible person. We're missing some locations. 
the ESY dates for sure. Yep. All right. So you got it. Location was blank. EdTech can't be there. ESY need to adjust those dates. Excellent job. So instead, making sure that we adjust those ESY dates, we want to put that location for every single service. And that special ed teacher is the responsible person. All right. Any questions about section six or seven? Or anything else, really? I mean. Oh, co-teaching. Yes, I am going to take one second to, I do have an example. I just have to find it because it's been a while since I've been asked about that. Let's see if I can find it. Nope, it's not going to come up, is it? No. Of course not. Okay. So you would document it in other on the service grid. And I am going to try to find that example. And I will send a screenshot of that example in the follow-up email as well. Ashley, are you writing this down for me? Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So, so far, I'm going to look for the definite answer about the alternate assessment standards and the co-teaching, because there is, we have given guidance around documenting that co-teaching. I just have to find it. Um, can you, if a goal is written, given SCI and speech consultation, student will, does the goal go in technical or functional? Assessment? That's a great question. <clears throat> I would say that depending on what the skill is that's in the goal for the SDI, so if it's an academic skill in the goal, then I would put it in the academic section. But if it's a functional skill in the goal, then it would go in the functional section. So base it off of what the skill is in the goal. Okay, moving on to section eight, least restrictive environment. Okay, so this is another problem on the IEP, which the IEP team is working to fix. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute with the prompt. But in section eight, where you put your least restrictive environment statement, this is really, we are looking for, for compliance, a statement around this bottom section where it says regular education environment shall occur only when the nature or severity of the disability of a child is such that education and regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. So this is really about stating in that section that nature or severity of the disability, disability that's keeping them from being in the general education with their same age peers. So, and we think of least restrictive, um, we have a couple of visuals here either as a staircase where you're going from that least restrictive of the general education setting up to that most restrictive where the hospital homebound, um, or you may think of it like this pyramid where that general ed is at the top, that's that least restrictive environment where you're going down to that hospital homebound where it's the more restrictive or most restrictive environment. And thinking about how you can return that student to the top as soon as possible. <clears throat> and this is the section eight on the IEP where you are filling in that least restrictive environment information. So for K to 12, you want to be thinking about the percentage um, reflecting the amount of time that the child is with non-disabled children. So this is based on their physical environment, not their instruction. So if you have a service grid that says that the location is general education for everything, then their least restrictive environment percentage would be 100% because they are with their peers 100% of the time, even though they're receiving specially designed instruction or other direct services, but it's within the general ed setting. And for the statement, when we're talking about that nature and severity of the disability, here's an example of how an academic LRE statement may look. 
where Susie's learning disability in reading and math are to such a degree that she requires time in a more restrictive setting to receive specialized instruction to address her academic deficits. So this student has a specific learning disability, so they've addressed that nature and severity of her disability. So they've named her disability, and then they're saying it's to such a degree that she requires these services and she needs to be in the special education setting. <clears throat> a functional LRE statement may look like Benny's autism is to such a degree that he requires time in a more restrictive setting to receive specialized instruction to address his language deficits. So again, you can see they've named the disability and they've talked about how that is affecting them and the severity of that disability is requiring them to be away from their same age peers. Well, the statement of services are given in both regular ed and special ed setting. Um, let me go back here for a minute. So, <clears throat> I this would be appropriate, I think. So, if the student's disability is to such a, a degree that they require time in a more restrictive setting to receive specialized instruction, they're having some in the restrictive setting and some in the general ed setting. I've seen others where they've said due to, um, you know, their the OHI is to such a degree that they require specially designed instruction, but they've identified that it's in the general ed setting in this statement rather than in the special education setting. So you can um, note the setting that the student is receiving their services in. Okay, hold on, I lost. And it's such a degree. No, sorry, Diane, there's no, to such a degree, um, definition. Sorry, I am not able to give you that. Uh, again, that is an IEP team decision, whether they are receiving their services in the general ed or special ed setting, depending on their level of need. So if your team determines that their gap is too large and that they need to be in the special ed setting, then that's where they are going to be. To state, could you reference the evaluations and data on progress to state based on a moderate language delay? Okay. <clears throat> Pam, I'm not really sure what you mean in your question about could you reference the evaluations and data on progress notes based on a moderate language delay in the least restrictive environment statement? Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Yep. Yes, you definitely could say that based on a moderate delay. That just seems to be our go-to phrase to such a degree, but you don't have to use that phrase. You can use something else instead, absolutely. Um, LRE percentage for the setting variation. So you would, uh, you would take it uh, out of the whole day. So if you have a student that is, has like, you know, the hour per day in the special ed setting, but they have more services, but they're in the general ed setting, you would just take that time. It's the time in the regular class. So you have to take the time that they're in. Let me just, oh, there's no percentage, right? You just have to take the time that they're in general education with their peers to figure out that percentage out of the full school day. We have 10 support hours a year. Do we Oh, given the nature and severity. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Katie, I do not know the answer to that. 
we are going to take that one back to the team. Also, Ashley's going to write that down. <laughs> and we will check in with them and get back to you about that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we're doing our chat books check-in. So that was good timing. You have to have two separate LREs. No, no, you don't. Thank, that's a great question, Audra. Those were just examples to see the difference between maybe one that's more academic and maybe one that's more functional. You do not need to have two separate. One LRE statement is enough. Yep. Okay. All right. So here is usually like in past IEP trainings, we've done sections on the written notice. However, as you can see, the IEP itself is long enough. So that is no longer part of this training. And there is a recorded written notice training that can be found at this link on our professional development page if you want to have specifics about the written notice. Here are those other considerations as you write your IEPs and work on other paperwork outside of the IEP. Um, this is just a quick one pager around eligibility forms. Um, and just a reminder that at the beginning of this um, training, there was that link to a more detailed training specifically around eligibility forms in that referral identification initial identification process. Um, but this is just a reminder that you really need to have all of the boxes filled in on any of those forms. Um, that summary of performance, that's for those graduating uh, seniors or exiting high school students. Um, and so section one must include data on that. The specific learning disability form must have must be signed by all of the team members, uh, include all of those strengths and weaknesses on the SLD form. You have that number four with those boxes and asking for strengths and weaknesses, you have to have something in every single box. Your verification must include data on all of your forms. Um, <clears throat> the adverse effect form, the NA means not available. So if you check NA, you do not have to put verification in there. But on the other forms, if you check yes or no, you do have to have verification with data. Um, and then all of the forms must be documented in the written notice that they were completed by the IEP team. So the speech and language form, when you're doing the severity rating scales, then you would check up in the left-hand corner, there's like a little box that says was not needed or was not complete. I can't remember what the, the words are, but there's a box up in the left-hand corner. And so you would check that. But yes, on that first, on the eligibility form, um, just put like not assessed or this area was not assessed or something like that on the speech and language eligibility form. And then on the severity rating scales, check that box. Ah, uh, does there need to be something? Okay, that, and then will you be sending us a link to the recording of this presentation? So when Julie is all finished with this recording, she will be uploading it to our website. Mm -hmm. okay. If anybody would like a copy sent directly to them, just email me and I will send it to you once it's done. I'll put my email address in the box. Okay, all right, thank you, Lena. Uh, can you have a blank box on the adverse effect form as long as you check NA or do you want NA in the box? No, if you check NA that it was not available, then there does not need to be any verification in there. But that's the only time that you would not have verification. Okay, and then again, procedural manual, excellent resource. It goes through every form and gives examples um, gives directions, instructions, all of that sort. So great resource for those forms. Uh, B13, which we're doing a training later today. If you want to come back and join us, we will be here. It's the Carly and Ashley show all day long. 
and Julie. Julie will be here with us too. I cannot forget about Julie. Um, so we will be going through transition plans in detail this afternoon, but this is just a quick snapshot, one pager of what we look at when we look at transition plans. Oh, good. Lisa's going to be there. Excellent. It's going to be great. What time? Oh, Julie, you're going to tell me. Oh, it's on my next slide. Just kidding. So this is the parental consent to invite other agencies for that B13 transition plan stuff. So this is where you can find that in the procedural manual. Look, there it is. B13 <laughs> trainings. If you can't make today, we have another one in January and another one in May. So, I mean, you've got plenty of opportunities, but today it's from one to three. Mm -hmm. So, And that will, will also be put on the website as well afterwards. So, <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, here's B11. This is around that child find uh, for those initial evaluations. We look at two parts. We look to make sure that procedural safeguards were given at initial referrals and then also that those initial referrals were completed within the 45 school days. Um, this is something that we do have to, uh, we have to, to OSA, my daughter is going crazy. Um, Office of Special Ed Programs, we do have to report this information to them along with that B13 information. And oh, here are the parental consent for evaluation and the referral to special ed is in the procedural manual. Abbreviated day, we have been looking at abbreviated day the last couple of years, and this has become a really big topic for us. If any of you were at MADSEC, you saw the abbreviated day, or hopefully you did, saw the abbreviated day um, training that we did there, or presentation, I should say, and we do have one on our website, and I'm pretty sure I have a link to that in the slide also. But these are the things that we look at when we come on site at file. We look at files to see these pieces um, that they're documented for abbreviated day. This is what we look for for educational. And Jennifer created these fantastic visuals to help kind of sort things out for you when there are <clears throat> educational needs for abbreviated day. And then there's also the medical for abbreviated day. These are the pieces that we look at. And again, that visual that Jennifer put together, outlining what needs to be documented when for that medical reason for a to day. We have what we call our fun facts, <laughs> very fun, around abbreviated day. This takes all of the components out of Muser and just puts it in one spot for you. Um, and just remember, abbreviated day, this is our famous phrase. If it's not in the written notice, it didn't happen because everything around abbreviated day is about documenting it in the written notice. And here is our link to that training for abbreviated day. There is an updated one. However, I believe Julia is working feverishly to get that out. Or have we not done that? Oh no, we did, I missed it. That's right, I missed the live one. I'll have to watch the recorded one. Um, so yeah, so the new one will be up soon, but this is the current one. All right, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but they are here when you get your copy of the PowerPoint, if you don't already have it, um, just commonly ask questions. So look away if you don't wanna see me click through a whole lot of slides. I'm just gonna click through these. You can read those at your leisure. All right, and any last questions before we wrap this thing up? Oh, good, Ashley dropped that PowerPoint in there one last time, great. <clears throat> okay, we have some questions. We will definitely follow up and get those answers out in the emails. This, there are two pages here that have our professional development schedule. Um, some are past now, but we have a lot of upcoming. Um, if you go to any of these registration links, they are live. You can register for them. Most of these trainings are from three to four in the afternoon. Those are our office hours. We do also have the full IEP and the all district B13s in here as well. Those are the ones during the day, but the majority of the others are from three to four. When we're looking at these PD opportunities, please feel free to share these with your general ed teachers, especially these two um, that would pertain to them, especially the discipline and manifestation determination we're doing tomorrow afternoon from three to four. And then special ed law for general ed teachers will be done in April. 
And then also those related service providers. We love when related service providers attend our PD. We are very grateful for that. And we think that the ones that are most pertinent to them are the writing measurable functional goals and avoiding outcomes that we'll be doing specifically in February. And then the consultation and related service goals will be in May. And here is a link to our feedback and contact our form. So if you are still with us, I am going to try to pull, there it is. All right, I'm gonna move my thing. I have to multitask here, it's very tricky. And try to talk all at the same time, which I don't do well, as you can tell. Okay, there's the feedback link for this form. Um, we ask for feedback. We really do adjust our professional development based off of what you tell us, or we try to as much as we can. And then if you would like a contact hour or to get answers to those questions, uh, please enter your email. Make sure you spell it correctly so it can get to you. And we will send that out as soon as we get those answers. Um, Oh, and today, when you go to this form and it says select the training, just I think it's full IEP training. Like that's the one that you want to select. Excuse me. Here is a link to our resources. The first one is our professional development calendar to sign up for any of those trainings coming up. Um, there's also the next one is our uh, recorded trainings. Those are that's the link to those and the PowerPoints are there with the recordings. Um, and then there are some other links for <clears throat> special ed resources. And one more time, our contact information, because if you ever have any questions or need some support, we are here for that. So please reach out to us. And thank you so much. Yes, contact Julie if uh, you would like a copy of this training and she will get that to you. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, Phew. all right. Any last questions before we end this for today? Yes, thank you all for sticking with us. It's a long one. All right, great. Have a great rest of your day. And those coming back for the afternoon, we'll see you then. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. One Thank you.